Hi guys, I'm Mike and welcome back to part three of the U of Pro Pro's Guide to Special Forces Assessment and Selection. Today we're finally going to talk about physical preparation and tell you a little bit about the basic techniques that you should be including in your program. Superb comfort, unique no-melt, no-drip construction, reliable elbow protection, and fast drying times. This is the Striker X Combat Shirt. We'll start off with a complete warm-up program that includes all the exercises that I feel are essential to get you prepared for your workout. Now keep in mind, those are all my favorite exercises that I chose based on my experience. If you think that there are other exercises that are better suited to achieve what you want to achieve, by all means, add them or substitute them for one of my exercises. In the end, remember, proper planning and preparation is always your own responsibility. The first thing we will do is activation exercises and we'll start out with the lateral banded walk which is sometimes called the monster walk. It will activate your lateral glute muscles. Next up is the banded hamstring stretch. This stretch is a dynamic stretch for the hamstring and at the same time activates your core muscle. Last activation exercise is the cook bridge. The cook bridge will relax your tight hip flexors and at the same time activate your large glute muscles. Next up is the dynamic warm-up part. We try to keep this as short as possible while at the same time giving you the maximum benefit in order to prevent injuries. First exercise is the knee grab. For the knee grab, make sure you're pulling the knee towards your chest, not the chest towards the knee. The froggy, when you do the froggy, pull your foot up as high as possible like you're stepping over a fence. Also pull the toe towards the knee. For the toe grab, it's important to reach towards the toes, but not see it as necessary to actually touch them. It's more important to keep your back straight and feel a stretch in the hamstring. The hands and heels drill is also sometimes called the elephant walk. For the elephant walk, try to keep your heels flat to the ground as you're walking and perform the walking movement by raising your hip. When doing the contralateral crawl, it's essential that you always move the hand and the foot at exactly the same time with the same speed. Also, keep your back straight. Just imagine you have an open beer on your back and you don't want to spill it. When doing the inquartata, remember that you're supposed to move in squares. So don't cross over your feet too far. For the lunge twist, always twist towards the side of the planted foot. If you want to do a little more advanced version, try to keep the rear knee off the ground. So that concludes our warm-up section. Now we're going to move into basic movement categories, which are the squat, the hinge, the vertical pull, the horizontal pull, the vertical push, the horizontal push, core training, and heavy carries. And we're gonna start off with the squat. The squat is a quad dominant movement. I'm not a big fan of regular bar squats. However, I am a fan of the goblet squat. Now for the goblet squat, I'm a fan because it's easy to do. It lets you go through full range of motion, which helps you to work on your mobility. And it's a very good exercise that you can include in your workouts. My preferred quad dominant up and down movement is the lunge. And I like to do something that I call the star lunge, which means you will lunge in all different directions or in eight different directions, and you will use both legs to do it. So we'll start off moving forward alternating the legs left and right, and then just keep moving over diagonally and in a clockwise or counterclockwise direction until you've completed the whole circle. For an advanced version of this, you can also alternate the length of your step. So you've seen him do the regular step where you have roughly a 90 degree angle in both knees. You can do a wide step and you can do the close step where you just do a very tiny step and you mainly focus on the up and down movement. So 
by doing all of these different movements with different stride length and under load, you will help yourself basically toughen up your ligaments and joints to injury proof them. If you want to make the star lunges even more advanced, you could use uneven weight on each side or just weight on one side instead of holding the weight in the middle like he did. The most commonly associated movement with the hinge movements is the deadlift. It's actually sometimes called a hinge lift. However, I'm not really a fan of going really heavy on the deadlift, but I would certainly use it in a greasing the groove version. So that's something that you might want to consider. I'm going to go into another hinge movement that's very well known, that's the kettlebell swing. Depending on what school you went to or what course you went to to learn your kettlebell swing, there are different philosophies. But the main thing is that you're using an explosive hip movement to accelerate the kettlebell. You're not pulling with your shoulders. You're also not doing squats. So it's really a movement that is coming from the hip. When I mention the category horizontal push, most people will immediately think bench press. But we're not doing bench press. Instead, we're using a unilateral movement again. So we're going to go for a one-arm push-up. Go to the starting position. The starting position is going to be back leg is straight back. The left leg is out at a 90 degrees. His arm is supporting on his leg. So this is the easiest version of the one-arm push-up. To make it harder, as you progress, you just shift that leg backwards. So now he's at a 45 degree angle. And the hardest version, obviously, if when he has both legs facing the rear. So alternatively, you can also use a bench, but please only do one-sided presses, preferably with a kettlebell or a dumbbell. Vertical push. Now the vertical push can go two ways, up and down. For down, we're going to do ring dips. Now I know ring dips are bilateral, so it's something that I usually don't like, However, you can see how you already need a lot of stabilization work in order to keep yourself in a good position. Okay? It's important to use full range of motion, so the top of your shoulder should be below the top of your elbow and the bottom position. Nice. Your shoulder should be nice and down, don't pinch up your ears. And the top position should be with the elbows fully locked out. When we're going for the upwards movement of the vertical press, you can do the shoulder press. Now in this case, I would obviously go for a one-arm press again, and I use the one-arm kettlebell press. The next movement category is the horizontal pull. And the best exercise, in my opinion, for the horizontal pull is the sled pull with the rope. It works your grip strength, it activates your lat muscles, and it's overall a good strength and conditioning exercise. So this movement is unilateral and also works on stabilization. Okay, go. So he will try to brace his upper body and keep it as stable as possible while doing underhand grips to activate the lats and pull the sled towards him. Of course, if you don't have the opportunity to use a sled like this, you can choose other exercises. Just keep in mind, try to do something unilateral that also requires stabilization, not just the machine. The vertical pull category. So one of the most obvious movements would be the pull-up. And yes, you obviously have to train the pull-up simply for the fact that the pull-up will be in most physical fitness tests. Another important thing to train is rope climbs. Now you would train rope climbs for two different reasons. One would be for efficiency. For efficiency, you need to have a good leg lock. Like you can see here, his feet are crossed over and they are locking the rope in place. Um, I prefer a version where the rope is actually outside of the legs, not between the legs to prevent rope burn. You can see if he's up there all the way, he can basically hold himself by just keeping the leg lock on with relatively little strength used by the arms. If you want to train strength, you obviously are not using a leg lock, but you're using arms only. Yeah, pretty simple, huh? In this segment, we're going to talk about some core exercises. Now, core exercises are always somewhere on the range between stability and movement. One exercise that is more on the side of stability is the get-up 
one that is more on the side of movement is the sandbag clean to shoulder. Some other good exercises for that are body weight movements on the ground like the crab walk or the bear walk or the scorpion and movement exercises off the ground is anything that has to do with slamming wall balls or slam balls into the ground or the wall. Okay, this one is the get up. It basically teaches you how to get up from the ground in the most efficient and effective way, even if you are moving quite a lot of weight at the same time. All right, positioning here is critical. So you wanna start off one leg straight, one leg off at a 45 degree angle, the other arm off at a 45 degree angle as well. Always watch the kettlebell. So keep your gaze on the kettlebell. That will help you with your balance. Press into the ground here to roll over. Roll onto the elbow, onto the hand. Don't move the hand. Okay, just keep going. You don't want to move the hand because if you have heavy weight overhead and you take away one of your main pillars of stabilization, nothing good is going to happen. The way down is just the exact opposite of the way up. The hand and foot positioning is critical again, but you can see he did it very well, 45 degree angles at both uh, arm and leg, so that went quite smoothly. Okay, so this is an asymmetrical sandbag lift to the shoulder. I prefer asymmetrical compared to symmetrical movements because nature doesn't work in symmetrical ways. So most of the movements you will be doing in real life will be somewhere preferring one side over the other. On this one, you're using an uneven grip and one fluid movement to get the sandbag on your shoulder. Make sure you alternate both sides. Cool. This is the category sprints and heavy carries. Somebody once asked Dan John what he would consider the two best overall exercises. And he said that in his opinion, most people need to do more sprints and heavy carries. So we're gonna start off with shuttle sprints. Okay, go. Shuttle sprints train acceleration, deceleration, and change of direction. All of those things are very useful when you're on the battlefield and trying to get from one cover to the next. But you also want to hit your body from other directions. So you want to have straight sprints on a track for max power generation. You want to do hill sprints as well, and also include tools like sled pushes. Heavy carries really is no rocket science, okay? So basically, you pick up heavy stuff and you walk around with it. There are several different options what you can do. So for example, you can have an object like a kettlebell that is easy to grip. You can hold it in one hand or you can use two kettlebells. If you use two different weights, again, you have somewhat more of a challenge than with two uh, equally weighted kettlebells. You can use the sandbag. You can carry the sandbag in one arm, in both arms, over your shoulder, in a bear hug, just like this. If you have access to heavy, unwieldy objects like a ball, by all means, use a ball. And like I said, all you're gonna do is you pick stuff up and you walk around with it for long distances. And that's basically it for heavy carries. So we went through the warm up, we went through the basic movements for strength and power training, and now we're going to talk about endurance training or conditioning. There are two different categories I want to talk about. One is cyclic conditioning, and one is conditioning through the use of full body movements. Now cyclic conditioning basically is a fancy word for doing the single same movement over and over again. For example, biking, swimming, rocking, running. Now what we want to do is, we obviously want to use a movement that we can actually use during selection. So no, biking is not one of them. We already talked about the different energy systems, so we're trying to hit all of them. We're going to work on our aerobic efficiency, we're going to work on the anaerobic threshold, and we're also going to work on maximum power output. For your aerobic efficiency training, you would start off unloaded. That means basically jogging and walking. We are going to try to stay within 60 to 70% of our maximum heart rate, and we're going to start jogging until we can jog for 30 minutes in that heart rate, and then no matter how far we jogged, so whether it's five minutes or 30 minutes, we would keep walking in that heart rate, 60 to 70% until we reach 90 minutes. The goal is going to be that by using this system, you're going to complete 90 minutes within the heart rate of 60 to 70% and finish 10 kilometers. For the loaded cyclic aerobic, that would be rock walking. 
you would still try to be within 60 to 70 percent of your max heart rate. And you would start off with eight kilo weight in your rucksack and you would go for 90 minutes. As soon as you're able to do those 90 minutes and finish 10 kilometers within your heart rate of 60 to 70 percent, you're ready to increase the weight in your rucksack for another two kilograms again until you hit those numbers. Every time you hit those numbers, you can put another two kilo in until you hit 24 kilos and then you're good. What is very important is that you don't jog or run during those exercises. It has to be walking. However, it's not your regular stroll in the park walking. It's walking as fast as possible. And yes, ranger shuffle is allowed. For your anaerobic threshold training, your heart rate would be between 80 and 90%. You would start off with five minutes and every week increase it by another minute until you hit 20 minutes. Once you hit the time limit for that day, you would keep on jogging for another 20 to 30 minutes, but at 70 to 80 percent. And finally, you would go down to walk up the rest until you finish a total of 90 minutes. And the walking part would be in 60 to 70 percent of your heart rate again. For the max effort training, the max effort training is practically sprint or agility training. For sprints, you would start off with 40 meters. You run, obviously, as fast as you can. <laughs> you walk back and then you run again. Now, you want to work your way up, basically, until you hit 10 repetitions. And when I say work your way up, you're only allowed to do an extra repetition. Obviously, the first time is going to be two at least. When your time for those 40 meters does not differentiate to the last time by more than two tenths of a second. So every time you're within that time frame, you can add one more repetition until you hit a total of 10. So once you finish 10 times 40 meters and you want to keep on training like that, you add 20 meters to the total distance and just start from the beginning with two reps and increase them accordingly. We already showed you how to do the shuttle run. Basically pick a distance. I would start with probably 10 to 20 meters, start in the middle, run to one side, change of direction all the way to the other side, back to the middle. Make sure you're always facing the same direction so your turns on each side are into different directions. You would alternate between shuttle runs and straight sprints every week. All right, now to conditioning with full body movements. What's the advantage over cyclic conditioning? Now cyclic conditioning is much easier to program because all you do is you have one movement and you only change the time basically and the distance and possibly the heart rate. So it's very easy to do programming in that style. There are, however, several advantages that I think full body movement conditioning brings you. First of all, you can use a much larger variety of movements, thereby programming different movement patterns. And you should always use movement patterns that are useful for what you are trying to do. Okay, so for example, rope climbs, pulling stuff, carrying heavy unwieldy objects, that sort of thing where you train your endurance, but not just your endurance, but also the movements. So when you program these CrossFit style movements and workouts, what you want to do is you want to hit certain time frames because the intensity pretty much is always going to be high. That's why it's called high intensity interval training. High intensity means that you're going as hard as possible for as long as possible without compromising technique. So as soon as your technique starts deteriorating, you need to dial down on the intensity and catch up to the technique again. When you're setting the time frame for your workout, you have two options. You can go the easy way, which is the MREP format, which says you have a certain amount of time, for example, 12 minutes, in which you're trying to perform as many rounds of the workout as possible. So you're trying to work as hard as you can in a set time frame. The other option is to go for time, which means you have a set amount of work you want to do and you're trying to do it as fast as possible. Now the problem with that is unless you have quite a lot of experience, um, a lot of times you misjudge the time frame where you will end up with. You usually think that you will be much faster than you end up being. I would group the time frames in four categories. The first category is less than five minutes. The second one is five to ten. The third one is ten to twenty and the last one is more than 20, open end. The most well-known workout protocol for less than five minutes is the Tabata workout. Most people don't really know what the Tabata workout actually is, so they call something a Tabata, but it's not really a Tabata. A Tabata was a Japanese doctor who did a very interesting experiment. 
He wanted to know whether high-intensity interval training will be superior to long-distance endurance training for short-distance endurance events as well as for long-distance endurance events. So what he did was, and this is important, the test group was the Japanese speed skating team. So those were highly trained professional athletes. They are not like regular guys off the streets that had never had done anything. So these guys were in a shape where they could actually have a very high power output in a short amount of time. When they compared the results of the training, they found that the Tabata group not only had a higher training effect for short-term distance, but also for long-term distance. So that made the high intensity training already a better option to do than long distance training, even for long distance. If you also factored in the time spent training, the high intensity interval training had a higher efficiency by 20 times. So it was 20 times more efficient when you compared it to the time they invested. The exercise he used was the assault bike. Now the assault bike, the guys that know it, know why he used the assault bike. Because it sucks. The assault bike basically lets you do a lot of work in a short amount of time and it doesn't care about your technique. It's not like rowing or some other workout where you actually have to have a certain amount of skill. For the assault bike, you don't need any skill. You can just go hard because there's no chance of you injuring yourself. On top of that, the assault bike uses your full body. It uses arms, legs and your core. So if you're trying to do these short-term, high-intensity workouts, you need to focus on movements where you should not be able to injure yourself because they are technically not difficult. They should use as many muscle groups as possible and they should not require any technical skill. So examples for those kind of movements would be obviously the assault bike or a sled push, which you can do without any chance of injuring yourself. When I want to program Tabata style workouts, I usually program two different ones back to back with a short break in between. Now when I say a short break, I mean one or two minutes, okay? Because I want to keep the heart rate high and I want to hit sort of different muscle groups, even though you're hitting multiple muscle groups at the same time. But I just want to get a more prolonged overall effect than just four minutes. Extreme rugged construction, super spacious pocket configuration, and knee protection that's both reliable and comfortable. Gear up with the Striker X Combat Pants. Visit ufpro.com. At the end of the workout, or actually at any point during the day, if you feel you have very tight muscles, you would want to do some static stretching. I will show you two exercises that I think are useful for most people, especially for people that are going to do a lot of heavy carrying over long distances. Okay, exercise number one is the pigeon stretch and we are going to do it sitting on a bench so that everybody can do it even if you're sitting at a desk during your day. So this is going to stretch the lateral glute muscles. He will cross over the leg, try to push the knee downwards, keep his back straight and bend forward from the hip. Make sure you're not rounding your back because that would take the stretch off the glute. To make the stretch more effective, you can use a technique called PNF or proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. You have to Google that probably. The technique works uh, in this way. You're going into the end range of motion. So this is your maximum stretch that you can achieve at this point. Now, you're breathing in as deep as you can to get some tension into the system. Try to bend forward a little bit more and now you put pressure into the leg. So you're actually contracting the muscle you're trying to stretch. You're contracting it as hard as you can for about five to 10 seconds. Then you suddenly exhale and relax, but go straight back into the extended new range of motion that you will have. So you're trying to use up the new range of motion in order for your body to be unable to get back to the old state. You can do that two or three times in a row, not more often. So we already set this one up. This is the couch stretch. Positioning is that you should try to get that knee as far back to a wall or the seat of a couch as you can and be upright. You're trying to activate the left glute in this case 
So really try to press this part of the hip forward into the ground. The activation of the glute is going to help to relax the uh, hip flexor. And here you can use proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation as well. So breathe in, push forward as hard as you can. Now actually push into the ground and forward, activating your hip flexor. Relax, breathe out, go straight back into the new range of motion. Repeat that for two or three times. Something almost no one enjoys doing is wrist conditioning. However, I think it's absolutely essential to injury-proof your wrists. So we're going to start off with him having his hands facing forward. Okay, always make sure that the elbows are facing backwards. So externally rotate your arms and then do just 10 repetitions of short impulses in and out of the pain range. So it's important that you actually feel pain on this exercise. On the next exercise, he will face his fingers backwards and just go 10 quick impulses into and out of the pain range again. Third movement is going to be his wrists together, finger facing outwards. Now he's going to do rotations. On those rotations, make sure that if you have a sticking point, don't force your way through the sticking point. Move around it. The sticking point will eventually give way. Now the next three are going to be on the back of the hands. Again, rotate the elbows facing towards you. And now you're going to do 10 little impulses backwards. The rotation of the arm is done to preload the system and make the um, impulses more effective. Last one is fingers facing forward or as far forward as you can. You can see the system is already preloaded so much that he can't even turn the hands all the way. So this is definitely some exercise that he needs. So always remember the wrists are usually the weak link if you want to transfer kinetic energy, like punching someone in the head.